Hey guys, what's up? It's Eric with Advanced Love Automotive. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. I'm here taking a look at this 2014, it's a Dodge Ram 1500 pickup truck with a 5.7 liter V8 Hemi engine. I got called out to come take a look at this because the engine has a misfire on cylinder number seven. Now the owner has already replaced all of the spark plugs. There's 16 spark plugs in this engine because it is a Hemi. So each cylinder has two spark plugs. And yes, he did replace all 16 with some high quality Iridium plugs. However, even after replacing all of the spark plugs, he still has the misfire. Now, I've already done a little bit of testing here and what I found was pretty interesting. So I figured I'd stop and pull the camera out and bring you guys along for the rest of this journey to trying to figure out what's going on here, why the cylinder number seven is misfiring. So first of all, let me take you guys over to the scan tool inside the truck and show you what we got. All right, guys, so moving inside the truck, I've got my scan tool over here on the seat. Uh, this is the Launch X431 Pro uh, 3S Plus. And so I've got the key right here. I'm gonna go ahead and stick it into the ignition. And let me take you guys over to the scan tool. So we'll go to system selection, PCM, powertrain control module. And then we're gonna select read fault code. So here are the two codes that we have stored in the PCM. Now, first of all, this fuel level sensor code, uh, this has actually been there for quite some time now. This is a regular customer of mine. So um, we've been meaning to do a replacement on the fuel pump fuel level sensor for this truck. However, he's been putting it off for, of course, cost reasons. And the fact that this fuel level sensor, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Like I said, this has been there for quite some time now. We're not gonna worry about the fuel level sensor code. The one we're more focused on is going to be this P2320. And if you read here, it says ignition coil seven secondary circuit insufficient ionization that's a very interesting code and we'll get to the code description in just a second here i do also want to mention that uh, there was another code present which was a cylinder number seven misfire code aside from this p2320 i believe it was a po307 which is a misfire for a cylinder number seven however like i said i was doing some testing before i decided to break out the camera and so i did do a quick test in which i swapped the coils and so what i did was i swapped the number seven coil for the number three coil let me take you under the hood and show you so moving under the hood let me show you guys what was the first test that i did uh, so again having that code for the circuit on the uh, coil number seven i wanted to make sure that we didn't have you know just a bad coil and so what i did first of all was i took our number seven coil which is located way in the back over here so this back here is our number seven ignition coil and what i did was i removed it and i swapped it with our number three coil which is located right here and so after I did that, I went back inside the truck and I used a scan tool to clear the fault codes. But let me show you guys what happens when we clear this P2320. So I'm gonna go back out and I'm going to clear our fault code. So clear fault code, clear fault code completed. We'll hit okay. And then we can go back in here and read the fault codes. So let's go back into DTC information and you'll see that our PO463 is there, but our P2320 or our cylinder number seven uh, ionization code is not there anymore. So I've cleared that code. Let me show you guys what happens when we start this thing up. So I got the key in the ignition. I'm gonna start it up. Now, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but we definitely have a misfire. And you can see right up here, we have the check engine light illuminated. So let me take you guys back over to the scan tool. So I'm gonna go back into read fault code. And there you go, guys. You can see that our P2320 code is back. And again, like I said, guys, I already swapped the coil from number seven to number three. And so if this was an issue with our ignition coil being bad, then that misfire should have moved over from cylinder number seven to cylinder number three. But if you guys look here, we still have a code for ignition coil number seven. So there's definitely more to this than just the ignition coil. Let me take you guys over to the code description and read you a little bit about what this code means. All right, guys, so here we have the code description on all data for our P2320 ignition coil number seven, secondary circuit, insufficient ionization. Now, as far as the code description, if we scroll down here, you can see that uh, they do give us a wiring diagram, but we'll get back to that in just a second. Um, if we come down here, you can see that it shows our monitored set conditions. It tells us here that this diagnostic runs continuously when the following conditions are met. Uh, for one, it says with the engine running, of course, the engine needs to be running in order for this code to be set. And then also the battery voltage needs to be greater than 10.4 volts. Now, as far as the set conditions, it says the powertrain control module, also known as the PCM, detects the secondary ignition burn time is incorrect or not present. Now, that's pretty interesting because according to this, that means that the PCM is actually monitoring the burn time of the ignition. I'm not sure how many other manufacturers do this. And to be quite honest, this is the first time I've ever seen a code set for ionization. So this might be something specific to Chrysler. Now, if we scroll down here, it does give us a list of possible causes. Uh, for one, it says we could have 
the ASD relay output circuit open or high resistance. We could also have a coil control circuit shorted to ground, or we could have a coil control circuit open or high resistance. It says we could have a bad spark plug, a bad ignition coil, or a bad PCM. So the list of possible causes is pretty long. Now, if we scroll down a little further here, it gives us some step-by-step -step information to help us diagnose the problem. Now, I've already scrolled through this and the information they give us is pretty basic. Essentially, they want us to check for ignition coil control operation. They want us to check for spark to make sure the ignition coil is generating sufficient spark. They also want us to visually inspect the ignition coil for damage or carbon tracking. Now, I'm not gonna say that this information is useless, of course, this is good information. However, in our case, I've already tried swapping the coil over from cylinder number seven over to cylinder number three. And if in fact we had a problem with the bad ignition coil, that misfire should have moved with the ignition coil. So our problem here is not with the coil itself. Now, if we keep scrolling down here, you can see that they give us some information about checking the ASD relay output. Basically, that's the power feed that goes to the ignition coils. I'll show you that in a second when we get to the wiring diagram. If I keep scrolling down here, you can see that they want you to check for a power feed at the ignition coil. And then if we scroll down here, you can see that they also want us to check the coil control circuit for a short to ground using an ohm meter. And they also want us to check the coil control circuit for an open or high resistance. Again, guys, very basic information. Down here, they want us to check related harness connections. They want us to look for corrosion, signs of water intrusion, bent terminals, improper connection, things like that. Again, very basic information. Then if we scroll down here, they do tell us to check for engine mechanical condition, which is pretty interesting because when it came to the list of possible causes, they did not mention anything as far as engine mechanical. So that means conditions like low compression and bad engine timing could also cause this code to set. Now here they want us to remove the spark plug and inspect it for contamination, fouling, or evidence of oil or coolant. Again, very basic information. They want us to look for cracks on the spark plug, carbon tracking, gap size, loose or broken electrodes. And if you have a problem with the spark plugs, they want you to replace them. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the owner of the vehicle did already have the spark plugs replaced and they put some high quality iridium plugs. Now, moving over to the wiring diagram, this is a very basic setup. If we zoom in here, you can see that in the middle, we have our powertrain control module. And if we scroll down, you can see that down here, we have our ignition coils. Now, the first thing I noticed that makes this system in particular really easy to diagnose is the fact that these ignition coils are only two wire coils. What that means is that the driver or the transistor that controls the coil is built into our PCM. Now, the reason this type of system is so easy to diagnose is because we can actually put an oscilloscope on our control wire and get a picture of the primary ignition waveform pattern. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with the ignition waveform pattern, it basically looks something like this. Over here to the left, we have what they call the dwell time. This is the time in which the PCM is grounding the circuit and energizing the coil. And then right here, we have this big line. This happens when the computer lets go of that ground and the magnetic field collapses, inducing a voltage spike. This is known as the firing line. Once that voltage spike drops back down, we have this moment in time called the burn time. This is where our spark is actually jumping the spark plug gap. This line is sometimes called the burn line or the spark line. Now, after the spark line, we have this little voltage spike here before it falls down, oscillates, and then goes back to normal. So that's pretty much the ignition waveform pattern in a nutshell. I don't have time to explain to you the entire thing in detail. That would be an entire class all of in itself. But just know that using this waveform and understanding how this pattern is formed, that can help you a lot when it comes to diagnosing these types of problems. So basically the next thing that I wanna do is I wanna go over to our ignition coil number seven. I wanna put an oscilloscope on pin number one, which is going to be our control wire. We're gonna to watch to see what our waveform looks like. And I'm also going to hook up a channel two on our pin number two, which is our power feed to our ignition coil, because we also wanna monitor the power feed going into the coil to make sure that it's not dropping out. If you guys remember, this power feed comes from the ASD relay. So if we follow it up here, you can see relay auto shutdown that's going to feed the power to all of our ignition coils so hooking up lab scope here should tell us everything we need to know all right guys so moving back over to the truck let me show you the setup that i have going on here so up here you can see i have my lab scope let me take you up here to the top where i am back probed on the connector for the number seven ignition coil now if you look here 
I have two channels. So I have uh, my channel number one, which is going to be the yellow wire. And then I have my channel number two, which is the green wire. There's only two wires on this coil. So again, one of these is gonna be the control wire, which I believe I have on my channel one. And the other one is going to be the power feed from the ASD. And that's going to be on the channel two. So over here, I've got the scope set up and you can see on channel one, I'm on a 50 volt scale and I'm on a one second time base here across the screen. And then on channel number two, I'm on a 20 volt scale because uh, basically what we're planning on seeing here or what we're hoping to see is that on channel number two, we should have a steady system voltage somewhere between 13, 14 volts maybe. And then on our channel number one, we should see our waveform for the primary ignition. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this thing up. Let's take a look at our lab scope. Take a look at that. You can see that we have our ignition pattern right there. Well, it just went away. Let me pause it real quick and let's move back. Okay, I see what's happening. So when the engine first started up, uh, you can see that the computer was giving this uh, ignition pulses. However, after a few seconds of running, you can see that the computer actually just shut this cylinder off completely. So we don't have any control on this ignition coil at this point in time. So what I wanna do is I want to uh, go ahead and see if we can get a zoomed in capture of this uh, waveform because again, right now, this is live data right here. You can see that uh, we're pretty much flatlined on both of these. So again, this is our main power feed into the coil. And you can see that uh, we're at 14 volts, so system voltage. And then over here, you can see the output from the coil going back to the computer. And again, there's no computer control on this wire right now, but I believe that's because the computer pretty quickly detected that there was a problem. There was a misfire on the cylinder and so it shut this coil off. Uh, let's go ahead and zoom in. Let's try to get maybe a 20 millisecond. Let's do a 10 millisecond. Let's try to get some detail in there. Okay, so we're pretty much zoomed in. I've got my trigger set up. We're gonna move back inside the truck. So we're gonna shut the engine off and then we're gonna start it back up. Okay, so let's move back to the lab scope. Okay, so here we go. And then again, it went away. I'm gonna pause it. We're gonna go back in time. I'm scrolling back, scrolling back, trying to find our waveform. All right, let me go ahead and shut the truck off and we'll take a closer look at this. Okay guys, so now that we have a still image of our ignition firing event here, you can see that during this time right here, we're at system voltage. And then when the computer decides to turn the ignition coil on, it grounds this circuit. This is our dwell time. And then once the computer lets off of that ground, that's when we have this big spike right here. This is going to be our firing line. Now, the first thing I notice about our firing line is that it looks pretty good. I mean, it's getting up here, upwards, somewhere around 40, maybe 45 volts, something like that. And so uh, this spike here looks pretty good to me. However, if you look over to the rest of this waveform here, we don't seem to have a spark line. It kind of just seems to be gradually going back down to system voltage here. So this is really interesting to see uh, this type of waveform. And even as I scroll through this, uh, you can see that our waveform pretty much looks the same. So I'm gonna scroll back. There we go. So again, you can see our system voltage there. Our computer grounds the circuit. It's holding it during this dwell time here. Then the computer lets off. We have this big voltage spike. And then you can see how our voltage just fades away there. And so that's really interesting. Now, the other thing to note here is that our power feed coming in to the coil is staying pretty steady at about 14 volts. And so what this tells us is that we don't have a problem with the power feed coming into the ignition coil. The other thing this lab scope is telling us is that we actually do have computer control on this ignition coil. The computer is actively trying to fire this ignition coil. And on top of that, this ignition coil looks pretty good because seeing this big spike right here going upwards of 40, 50 volts, that's a good sign. That tells us that we have a nice healthy coil. And again, guys, I know it's not gonna be a bad ignition coil because I've already swapped the ignition coils and that didn't change anything. All right, guys, so I think the next thing that I wanna to try to do is compare this ignition waveform on the cylinder number seven to the cylinder right next to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the truck back up. There's our waveform on our cylinder number seven. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and move my lead over from our cylinder number seven to our cylinder number five right next to it. I'm gonna pull this lead out of here and then we're gonna switch it over to cylinder number five. Hopefully you guys can see this. I am back probing the control wire here on our cylinder number five. Now let's take a look at our lab scope. And take a look at that guys. This is what our primary ignition waveform looks like on our cylinder number five. This is what the cylinder number seven should look like. Again, you can see we have our system voltage right here. Our computer grounds the circuit. 
then we have this big voltage induction spike right there and then we have what we're missing on the other cylinder which is this burn line here so this burn line here is our spark jump in the gap and so this is what we're supposed to see we're supposed to see a big induction spike there then we have this burn line and then it just goes back to normal and you can see we have our little oscillations here at the end but again this is what a healthy firing event should look like and once again just for comparison i'm going to switch back over to the number seven and i'm going to see if it's still firing that coil okay so i've got that back probe back in on our control wire for our cylinder number seven we'll move back over to the lab scope and you can see the computer shut that cylinder off so anyways you guys get the idea we definitely have a problem with our cylinder number seven it's time to figure out what our next step is all right guys so let me show you what our next test is going to be we are going to be doing a relative compression check it's possible we could have maybe a bad spark plug but again like I said, they replaced all of the spark plugs already and they're still having the same problem. Now, I know that's not a for sure thing. Of course, we are going to check the spark plugs, but I wanted to rule out a mechanical problem with this engine because when we look at the waveform, it does lead me to believe that there is a possibility that we could have a mechanical problem. Now, doing the relative compression check is actually really easy. It's pretty much non-invasive, so we don't have to go in there and do any actual compression measurements with the gauge. We can actually do a relative compression check here at the battery and let me show you guys how i'm going to do that so if you look over here i have my leads from my lab scope on my channel one so again i'm connected to the battery so we're on the positive lead over here and on the negative lead over here and so we're going to do this just by looking at the battery voltage we're not going to be using an amp clamp i know i've done a lot of relative compression testing in the past using an amp clamp and that's a great method and all but sometimes it can be difficult to locate the starter cable doing it this way is just an easier way to do it and since I've started doing it this way, I've pretty much just been doing it this way ever since. So let me show you guys how I have my lap scope set up. So again, I've got two channels over here. On my channel number one, I'm connected to the battery. Now, the reason I'm on a one volt scale is because I'm actually uh, AC coupling this. So if you go over here, uh, you can see that on my channel one, I have AC coupling turned on and I also have the signal inverted. Now, the reason I have the signal inverted is because this is going to give us the opposite of the voltage dropping every time the amperage rises. So instead of the voltage dropping when the amperage rises, the voltage is going to be going up on our meter here. And of course, the AC coupling is going to allow us to only see the up and down movement. That way we can zoom in and get a nice detailed view of it. Now on my channel two, I'm connected to the cylinder number one ignition coil. And so you can see I'm on a 50 volt scale here. And so every time the cylinder number one ignition coil, you can see that my back probe is installed right over there. That is our cylinder number one ignition coil control wire. Every time the cylinder number one fires, we're going to see that voltage spike here. And then what you'll notice is that I'm on a two second time base. So I wanna have a lot of time here so I can see the cranking event in repetition. So now that I have everything set up, let me move inside, crank this engine over, and we'll take a look at our readings. Now, luckily cranking this engine over without it starting is actually really easy because this does have a clear flood mode. So all I have to do is put the accelerator all the way to the floor, and then I can go ahead and crank the engine without it starting. So let's go ahead and crank this thing. Also, listen to the way the engine cranks. Now I'm going to shut it off. Let's take a look at our meter. All right, guys, so check this out. Over here on the meter, we have our results for our compression test, or excuse me, our relative compression test. And so if you look here, you can see that already we pretty much have even humps all the way across the board. Now, if you want to go into more detail, you can see that um, every time this green line fires, that's going to be our cylinder number one. Now, if you follow the firing order, of course, you can count how many cylinders there are. Again, this is a V8 engine. So if we count here, this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then one again. Now, of course, that's not the firing order. I'm just counting the number of cylinders between each firing event, just to show you that all eight cylinders are showing up here. Now, if you look at this here, you can see that none of them have low compression at least it's not obvious now if i scroll back in time you can see another capture of this again we're pretty much even across the top here i'm going to scroll back again we see the same thing again two firing events right here so this is a full 720 degrees of crank rotation right here 
And so all of our cylinders seem to have good compression. I'm gonna keep scrolling through the event here. Again, all the way through here, you can see that all of our humps, or excuse me, the peaks to our humps pretty much line up evenly. Now, if I scroll back, you can see that this is the start of our cranking event. So again, if I scroll through this here, it's pretty much the same all the way. I don't see any cylinders that have low compression. A few moments later. All right guys, so check this out. I went ahead and I pulled both of the spark plugs out of cylinder number seven. Our compression test didn't yield any positive results there. So I moved on to removing the spark plugs. You can see I've got them both out up here on top of the hood. And looking at these spark plugs, I mean, they look pretty good to me. They're not super fouled. I mean, let me pull this out here. Take a look at the ceramic. Again, you can see that these are NGK Iridiums. And so these are some high quality spark plugs. These are not cheap. Let's take a look at the other one. No cracks in the ceramic. And looking at the tip over here, the fine point, I mean, it looks pretty good to me. It's a little dirty. I mean, it doesn't smell like fuel or anything. So at this point, I don't suspect that we have an issue with these spark plugs. Again, they replaced all of the spark plugs with these NGK Iridiums and none of the other cylinders seem to have a problem with them. It's just our cylinder number seven. One hour later. All right, guys, so fast forward. Uh, let me apologize. I did skip a few things uh, that I wish I could have shown you, but uh, I'm running out of daylight here. So I'm trying to figure out exactly what's going on uh, before I have to leave. And so one of the things that I did off camera is I actually went ahead and I swapped the number seven injector with the number five injector. And so it was pretty easy. There's only two bolts that hold the fuel rail up here and I popped it up and I just pulled the number seven injector out and the number five injector out and I swapped them over. I put it back together and lo and behold, we still had the same code, the same misfire for the cylinder number seven. And so I was able to rule out an issue with the fuel injector. I didn't suspect it to begin with. However, I just wanted to rule it out because the next thing that I'm thinking is that I wanna remove this valve cover. Now, let me explain to you why I wanna remove the valve cover. So if you guys didn't know, these Hemis are pretty prone to having lifter failures, especially the models that had the DOD or cylinder deactivation system in which basically sometimes the engine runs on only four cylinders, then sometimes it runs on eight cylinders. It's a really stupid design. What happens is that these lifters can fail. I've had this happen before. And actually, if you go back on my channel, the very first video I ever posted on YouTube was a video where I was covering this issue in which I had a Hemi uh, Dodge pickup truck, Dodge Ram, that had a misfire. And this misfire to me, it was pretty much a mystery. It was very difficult for me to solve because it didn't misfire all the time. It would really only misfire under a load. I know in this case, this thing seems to have a dead misfire. However, what I found in that video was that one of the lifters, the roller had locked up. And what happened is that it dug into the camshaft. And when it dug into the camshaft, it essentially ground the camshaft and made the peak smaller, essentially reducing the lift of the valve. Now, the interesting thing about this is that in that video, when I did the relative compression test on that engine, the engine had good compression. Because if you think about it, guys, the valve was still opening, so it was letting air in. However, it wasn't opening up enough to allow enough air to come into the cylinder for proper combustion. And so that's why it had the misfire and it passed the compression test. Now, the only way I was able to determine that that was what happened was I removed the valve cover and I cranked the engine over and I watched the valve spring move up and down. And what I saw was that as the engine was turning, all of the other valve springs were moving up and down quite a bit. However, the one that had a bad lifter it was only moving up and down very little. And so I wonder if that's the problem that we're having here. And the only way for me to figure that out right now is to just go ahead and remove the valve cover. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this valve cover off and see if we can find anything. A few moments later. All right, guys, so fast forward. I managed to get the valve cover off. You can see that we got a good view of the valve train. Now, I already went through and verified that we didn't have anything obvious. Uh, none of these springs are broken. Nothing looks like it's loose. I can grab all of these and they all seem pretty tight and so, uh, already, you know, I don't see anything obvious, but again, like I said, what we want to do is we want to crank this engine over and take a look at how these valve springs move. So I'm going to see if I can find somebody to help me crank this engine over. All right, guys. So we're going to go ahead and crank the engine over. Dale. Okay. Parle. Dale otra vez.
all right guys so once again fast forward i've got the valve cover reinstalled you can see that everything's put back together now at this point i'm getting really discouraged because uh you know i wasn't able to find anything pulling the valve cover off if you looked at the way the valve springs were moving up and down uh, they were all pretty much moving up and down evenly i didn't see any of them that weren't moving up and down as much as let's say the one next to it and so again pulling the valve cover off didn't yield any results i don't think that we have an issue with the camshaft or a lifter on this engine and so i'm starting to move more and more toward it being maybe a bad pcm now before i go in that direction there is one quick thing that i wanted to try to do and so what i did was i took the spark plugs out of cylinder number seven and i moved them over to cylinder number three and i moved the cylinder number three spark plugs over to cylinder number seven essentially i'm just playing swap tronics right now because i really don't know what else to do but again i want to rule out whether or not it's a problem with the spark plugs i mean it's highly unlikely because all of these spark plugs are new we took them out we did a visual inspection and they looked good however with electronics nowadays you never know what you're going to find so again like i said i swapped over the spark plugs and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to move inside the truck i'm going to clear the codes we're going to restart this thing and we're going to see what codes come back i'm going to clear the fault code yes we want to clear this fault code we'll hit okay and then we'll go back into the read fault code menu dtc information our code for the cylinder number seven ignition coil is gone uh, let's go ahead and back out and then i'm going to start the truck back up okay we'll let this run for a minute okay so the idle has stabilized let's take a look at the scan tool here uh, we're going to go back into read fault codes dtc information and let's see if this switched over to cylinder number three damn yeah we still have ignition coil number seven secondary circuit insufficient ionization p2320 man guys at this point i don't know all right guys so just for grins and giggles i decided to do another quick capture of the primary ignition on the cylinder number seven again i replaced the spark plugs i did the whole swaptronic thing where i took number three spark plugs and i moved them over to seven and so this is with spark plugs that work in a different cylinder in cylinder number seven and you can see we have the same waveform happening over here and so us seeing the waveform like this earlier has nothing to do with the spark plugs i feel like this is starting to look more and more like a bad pcm all right guys so at this point i'm pretty sure that what we're dealing with is a bad pcm i think that the driver for the cylinder number seven ignition coil is probably fried i mean we've checked everything else we made sure that we don't have an issue with the spark plugs we don't have an issue with the fuel injector we don't have an issue with the ignition coil we don't have a mechanical issue everything else has already been ruled out our problem has to be inside the pcm now when it comes down to calling a bad pcm of course one of the things that we need to do is check all the main powers and all the main grounds you guys have seen me do this plenty of times before in my other videos i don't think it's necessary for me to show you guys step by step how i check the powers and grounds this video is probably going to be long enough already but i think what i am going to show you guys is one more check that i want to do before we install a pcm in this vehicle we need to make sure that none of these ignition coils are shorted out we want to be sure that the driver inside the computer did not fail because of a shorted ignition coil so what i want to do really quick is a current ramp test on all of the ignition coils to see if we find one that has excessive amperage and is showing signs of shorting out all right guys so what we're looking at here is all of the coil ramps the coil amperages and what we're looking at are the peaks and so if you take a look at the numbers over here on the side you can see this is four right here and if i change this from a 10 amp scale uh, over to a 20 amp scale you guys can see that none of our coils are even reaching eight amps of current all of our coils look pretty even none of them have excessive amperage now i can take you guys in for a little bit more detail so we'll zoom in to let's say 50 milliseconds and you can see we have a nice current ramp on that coil i'm going to zoom in a little bit further 20 milliseconds you can see a nice ramp there and again we have a peak somewhere around seven amps of current this waveform looks pretty good i think all these coils look good two weeks later all right guys to so fast forward we are back and this time we have a replacement pcm unfortunately this does come pre-programmed so i won't be able to show you guys how to program the pcm it is a remanufactured unit and they were able to program it for about 50 bucks which is a lot cheaper than having me do it for me to have to program this myself using my j box it does require for me to purchase three different subscriptions from chrysler which add up to well over 100 bucks just so i could program this thing so having them do it for 50 bucks 
only made sense. So anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and install this thing and see what happens. All right, so we've got the replacement PCM installed. Let's go ahead and connect the scan tool. All right guys, so back inside the truck, I've got the scan tool connected and right now we're using the Launch X431 Pro Mini. The first thing we're gonna wanna do is go into PCM, powertrain control module. We'll go into module information. And then we're just gonna look here to verify that they did program the correct VIN number. This is the correct VIN number. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. Then I wanna show you guys that if we read fault codes, you're going to see that we do have a few fault codes for the ETC system. Again, we still have this fuel level sensor. We're not gonna worry about that, but we scroll down here you can see that we have this p2111 p2127 a p2122 and it looks like that's it now if you look at these code descriptions you'll see that they are related to the accelerator pedal position sensor and so what we need to do before we try to clear these is we need to go back into our special functions now under the special functions you can see that there's a lot of things that we can do uh, first of all we could check the pcm odometer this function allows you to write in the odometer mileage i already had them do that when they programmed the computer so i'm not going to worry about that next up you can see that we can program the vin number into the pcm again i already had them do that as well but one of the things that we need to do if we scroll down here is we need to learn etc so we'll hit okay it says this feature will learn tp voltages and ap position so we'll hit okay it gives us a little bit of information here we'll hit okay now it tells us to press and hold the accelerator pedal to the floor so i'm going to go ahead and put my foot all the way to the floor on the accelerator and then i'm going to push okay it says hold accelerator pedal firmly to the floor now it says release accelerator pedal and press okay so we're going to release and we're going to press okay etc learn complete now we're going to go back to clear the fault code all right so after doing our etc relearn you can see that I went ahead and I cleared the trouble codes. And the only one we have stored is our PO463 for the fuel level sensor circuit. Now, before we can actually start this thing, there is one procedure that Dodge does want you to do, and that is to cycle the key off and then back on. And so we're gonna count to two, one, two, and then we're gonna turn the key off. I usually like to pull the key out. And we're gonna count to about 10 seconds. And then we're gonna go ahead and put the key back into the ignition, turn the key on, and then just do this probably two or three times. I like to do it three, just to be sure. And so we're gonna go ahead and put this back in. Now what this procedure is doing is it's relearning the closed position of the throttle body. Now that we've done that, we should be able to start the truck up. Now you guys can see that our check engine light is still on, of course, because we still have the trouble code for the fuel level sensor. But I can tell you already, the truck feels a lot better. I don't feel a misfire. Let's go ahead and pull up the scan tool and check our misfire counters. We'll click on which cylinder is misfiring and bam, there you have it guys. Check out cylinder number seven. We have zero misfires. And just to show you cylinder number eight, let's scroll up here. There's our cylinder number eight, zero misfires. So we have zero misfires all across the board here. That's a fix. All right guys, so because I can't seem to leave well enough alone, I've got my lab scope connected and I am hooked up to the ignition coil, cylinder number seven. And if you guys don't believe me, let me show you. You can see my lead going over to cylinder number seven ignition coil back there. Now let me take you guys over to the lab scope and check this out. You can see that now we have a good waveform. Look at that dwell time, that firing line, and that spark line. Our waveform looks great. All right guys, well there you have it. After replacing the PCM, we no longer had the code for the cylinder number seven ionization. It has been well over two weeks since we replaced the PCM, and so far, everything is working great. So at this point, I'm gonna end off the video. Like I always say, thank you guys for watching. I hope you found the video useful, informational, educational, entertaining. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.